Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Man, I'll tell you what. Who, who here is, is here for the first time? All right, let me tell you something. We come up here every Sunday, and I try not to let it lose its, its you know, the wow factor, but today is amazing. Praise God, yeah. This is awesome. Welcome to Loon Mountain Ministries Mountaintop Worship Service. Um, this is, but this is New England weather, isn't it? You know, like in the last 10 minutes, we've gone from a rainbow to spitting snow rain combo to socked into clouds. And here we are again. I'll invite you to join us and stand. Um, we're going to start off by singing Love So Great. Mountain Ministry. How are you guys this morning? Oh, this is amazing, huh? Well, we absolutely are glad that you guys are here because you know what? Yes, we can come up on this mountaintop alone and this morning would be incredible because it snowed up here this morning. It had a rainbow, as he told you. We call it a snowbow. It had clouds. It had everything. But without you, it's not the same. You know, Jesus didn't come and give his life for the snow. He didn't come and give his life for mountains or for rainbows or for rivers. He came and gave his life for you and for me because we were created in God's image and he loves us. And how do you like God's coloring book? Pretty good, huh? 
How many are excited that God does not color in the lines? <laughs> God came out of heaven. He stepped out of what was in his lane, what was in his boundaries or in his lines to come and to shed his blood for you and for me here on earth and to not stay there but to rise again so that we can have eternal life for those that put their faith, hope, and love in him. How cool is it that we have a God that we can worship out here on a gondola ride on the side of the mountain. So we're so, so glad that you guys are here. It's amazing how many new people come to our service. We're so excited to join you worshiping the God of heaven and earth. Hey, the Bible says that God is our father. The Bible also says that God is our friend. But we also know that life brings about pain and life brings about sorrow. And sometimes we call God foe, and we want to put up our dukes. So if that's you this morning, you are welcome here. We hope that you feel close to God. Sometimes we think intellectually, or we think maybe through some things that we've read, and we begin to go call God fake. We have our doubts. You know what? I'm paid to believe in God, right, as a pastor, and I have my doubts. And if you are in that space this morning where you're like, I just don't think he's real, you are welcome here as well. And it is our prayer that in this space that you will feel the presence of God and that that presence of God will draw you into believing in him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Would you join me in prayer? What's cool about Outdoor Church, you don't have to close your eyes. God, we love you. We thank you so much for this space. Wow, look at this sun and this view, God, and the contrast between the blue and the clouds and the red and the oranges and the yellows and the greens. Man, God, you are so good and you are just, your creativity is on such display this morning. So God, you know what? A bunch of our troubles exist down in that valley. Work's down there. Hard relationships are down there. Stress about finances down there. Stress about health or health of loved ones are down there. But God, right now on the mountaintop, we're going to pause from those troubles. And we're just going to enjoy the goodness of God. But we know, God, we can't live here. So would you help this perspective to change ours so we can go back in the valley and live filled with the Spirit by the gift of your salvation? Thank you for Loon Mountain and letting us come up this gondola, opening this space for us. God bless them. May they know that you are real and that you love them by the presence of your people on the mountain today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. See you. 
Father, this morning as we gather, as we uh, worship you together, as we pray, um, and as we see your beautiful creation, would we be reminded uh, that your mercy is more, that we can rest in the forgiveness and grace of Jesus. Um, we're so thankful for you today and, and the grace of you to keep the, the weather at bay and the sun coming out and um, just this beautiful space that you've given us. Lord, we love you. We trust you. Today, we lift your name high. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. How's it going, everybody? My name is Nathan. I am the youth pastor here at Loon Mountain Ministry. Um, super excited to be up here. Obviously, I was telling a couple people before the service, when the weather looks sketchy, that's when the coolest things happen on the mountain. Um, so you guys got to see it firsthand um, as we saw that rainbow go by and the sun hitting those leaves over there. Don't let that, don't let that weather scare you away. So I'm super glad you guys got to make it out today to join us um, as we worship. Just a, I'm going to turn your attention to the back of your bulletins. Um, on the back, there's some announcements um, that we want to go through uh, with you guys. Uh, first, first thing, um, you know, we originally planned for Columbus Day to be the last weekend on the mountain. Uh, if you guys are around next weekend, we will be back up here again. So we're excited to do that. Um, so next weekend, same time here at 11 a.m., top of the mountain. Uh, the following week, which is the 23rd, we will be back into uh, Encore Thrift Store. If you don't know much about our ministry, we, we run a service at the mountain. We also run a thrift and coffee shop in town called Encore Thrift and Coffee. And uh, we do our services down there as well for a local community. There's some services that happen uh, you know, like this morning at 9 a.m. down there. Um, but the rest of the year when we're not at the top of the mountain, we do have services down there. And uh, starting on the 23rd, those will be at 10 a.m. in Encore Thrift and Coffee. Um, one other service that um, I didn't mention already is Waterville Valley. Uh, Waterville Valley has started doing mountain services very similar to what we're doing here. So we're super excited at God's faithfulness to uh, continue to be a light um, and, and use uh, his people to make him known in, in these different ski resorts. And we have a passion for ski resort ministry. And um, so there's services that happened all summer long there today or this morning, which is already finished, was their final one of the year. So uh, super excited about what God's doing down there. The top thing you'll see on your bulletin is trunk or treat. Every Halloween, uh, we do a little trunk or treat over at the Penguin Ski Club in town. That's off of Maple Street. Really, really fun uh, opportunity to be involved in the community. And we'll usually have, I don't know, 10 to 15 cars lined up, um, which is a great time for kids to come through. Um, if, uh, if you're interested, um, please, or if you're around Halloween, please come check out Trunk or Treat and come say hi to a whole bunch of us. I know a bunch of the staff will be there. Uh, and then if you are a local and you're around and you're like, Hey, I want my trunk to be a treat <laughs> to be others. Um, you'll see uh, Casey Macchio. You can get a hold of her and her email is right there. Um, SFC Conference. SFC stands for Snowboarders and Skiers for Christ. Uh, it's a worldwide organization um, that we work with on a lot of things. Uh, a lot of us love what they do. I actually came to faith through their ministry. So praise God for that. Um, but they do a national conference every year. And uh, this year it's local. Um, in Waterville Valley, you'll see November 17th through the 20th. If you want to look up information about that conference, uh, you can go to, uh, I believe it's sfcusa.org, um, and you'll be able to find more information. But um, really, really cool. If you love Jesus, which if you're here, I hope you do, and if you love skiing and snowboarding, then what a great opportunity to be encouraged um, from other people who have that same passion to make Jesus known at ski resorts around the country and around the world. Um, I already mentioned a little bit about the fall services. Uh, 811 Youth is our youth group. Um, we are a middle school and high school youth group that meets on Wednesday night. So if you're around during the week and you're in middle school or high school and you want to come hang out, uh, we go from 7 to 9, and that is right at Encore Thrift and Coffee. The, th um, the coffee shop is, is open and running, so you can get 
uh, discounted drinks and stuff like that. It's a really fun time. Um, so, and if you have any questions about that, you can uh, talk with me after the service or you can, you'll see at the bottom um, of your page, there's a couple of emails. That's a great way to get a hold of us if you want to get a hold of us. So, yeah, with that said, um, we're going to transition to our kids' lesson. Um, every week we do a kids' lesson up here. My wife Eunice is, is going to be sharing with you guys today, but I highly, highly recommend it because there's always fun, sweet incentives usually. Um, so if you want to come down, uh, we're going to have all the kids kind of just gather right here on these first like five or six steps. So come on down, kids, and uh, my wife's going to take it away. Don't be shy. I don't bite, at least not hard. Okay, so I asked this question to the kids at Waterville last week when I led the lesson. What animal are you guys feeling like today and why? Anyone? A human. <laughs> well, if you could pick an animal. Someone said to me last week that they felt like a turtle because they wanted to curl up in their shell because they were cold. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one example. Anybody else have an animal they might feel like this week? Isla? A snake. Why do you feel like a snake? Because you like slithering. <laughs> Is it going to hold on you? Koala? Why do you feel like a koala? Because you're sleepy. I'm a little sleepy, too. That's some great. So I have a few questions for you guys before we read our story today. Do you guys like rules? No, you're shaking your head no. The rest of you guys like rules? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> That's crazy. How about another question? Have you ever questioned a rule that your mom or dad told you? about, well, why should I do that? Yeah, you're shaking your head, yeah. A bunch of you guys, you're, more of you are shaking your head about that question. So the answer to the first question of whether you like rules is, is probably no, because you questioned why your parents told you to do something, right? So the Israelites, there are some people in the Bible, and they felt like that a lot too. And oftentimes they questioned and they complained um, when God told them to do something or God sent them somewhere. So we're going to read a story from the book of Exodus today. Okay. And so there they w all were, grannies, granddads, babies, uncles, aunts, children, moms, and dads out there in the middle of the desert. They had blisters from all the walking. They were hungry and thirsty and much, much too hot. We don't like it, they said. It stinks. And so did they, for none of them had taken a bath in weeks. Gross. <laughs> now remember, because this is something they'd forgotten. God had done amazing things for his people. He'd hidden them inside a cloud. He'd moved the sea. He'd set them free. But God's people still weren't happy. They didn't care about being free. Wasn't it better when they were slaves? At least they'd had lots of nice food to eat. God doesn't want us to be happy, they said. It was the same lie that Adam and Eve had heard all those years before. God has brought us out here to kill us. He doesn't love us. But they didn't know God very well, did they? Every day of their journey, God kept showing his people how well he would look after them if they would trust him and obey him. When they were hungry, God made the sky rain with food, bread coming down from heaven. What is it? They asked each other. They didn't know, so they called it, what is it? Which, of course, was a very good name when you don't know what something is. When they were thirsty and started quarreling, God made water flow from a rock. And Moses called that place quarreling, because that seemed like a good name, too, because that's what happened there. And still, God's children didn't trust him or do what he said. They thought he could do a better they could do a better job of looking after themselves and making themselves happy. 
But God knew there was no such thing as happiness without him. So God led them to a tall mountain. God wanted to talk to his people and show them what he was like. He wanted to help them know him better and tell them about the special land he was going to give them. The whole earth belongs to me, God said, but I have chosen you. You are my special family. I want you to live in a way that shows everyone else what I'm like so they can know me too. God called Moses up the mountain, kind of like a mountain that we're on right now. The great mountain shook. A thick cloud fell. Thunder roared. Lightning crackled. And God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. I want you to love me more than anything else in all the world and know that I love you too, God told them. And that's the most important thing of all. God gave them other rules, like don't make yourself pretend gods, don't kill people or steal or lie. The rules showed people, God's people how to live and how to be close to him and how to be happy. They showed how life worked best. God's promises always look after you, Moses said. Will you love him and keep those rules? We can do it. Yes, we promise. But they were wrong. They couldn't do it. No matter how hard they tried, they could never keep God's rules all the time. God knew they couldn't, and he wanted them to know it too. Only one person could keep all the rules, and many years later, God would send him to stand in their place and be perfect for them. Because the rules couldn't save them, only God could save them. So. All right. So, how did God provide for Israel in this story? Anyone remember? Yes? Raining bread. Ten Commandments. Yep. What else? And the water from the rock. You guys got it all. Good listening. And so they called the bread, what is it? That's kind of a funny name, right? Because they didn't know what it was. And they called the rock quarreling because that's what they did there. Um, so God gave Israel food. He gave them water to drink. He gave them the Ten Commandments, which I don't know about you guys, but sometimes being given rules doesn't really feel like a gift, right? Sometimes rules are hard to follow. Why did God give Israel rules? Any ideas? Yes? Because they weren't following him. So God gave Israel rules because he was showing them how life works best. So... They, they said they would follow the rules, though, didn't they? But did they follow them? Do you think that you guys could follow all the rules perfectly? No. <laughs> no. Can anyone follow the rules perfectly? Y yes? <laughs> you can? That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, the answer is no one except for one person who walked on earth. Any ideas? Jesus. Exactly. And why could Jesus follow the rules? Yes, because he's God's son. So rules show us how to live, but rules can't save us. Who saves us? God. And how? Any ideas? Has something to do with Jesus and what he did. <laughs> Anyone? God saves us through his son, Jesus, coming and giving his life on the cross dying for our sins but he didn't stay dead so we didn't just have our sins forgiven he rose from the grave and went to heaven so that we could rise when we die someday and be with God forever in heaven so for everyone kids and adults being a Christian isn't about following rules or doing the right thing um, it's about a relationship with God trusting in him to provide for you as the Israelites we're kind of forced to trust for him for him to provide for the bread in the water, relying on him for all things and believing God knows best. And that's why we follow the rules, not to earn God's favor or to be with God or to be a Christian, but because we believe that God knows best and that he designed the best way for us to live. So our snack today does not have anything to do with the lesson, but it is fruit snacks, and usually kids <laughs> like fruit snacks. So if you come here to me, I will give you some fruit snacks.
All right. Whoa, that's really loud, Dan. Are you guys there? Check, check. Wow, that's really loud. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you, Eunice. Hey, uh, a lot of folks ask, how can we support what's going on here? And we would love your support. Normally, we have these clipboards out here, but it was snowing and raining when we were up here earlier. So we didn't. Here, Wyatt, keep going. You want a gummy, brother? Yeah, there you go, dude. Here you go. I get the, I get the assist. I get the assist. Tell them I get the assist, though, okay? You're welcome, guys. What's up? Pound it? That's what I'm talking about. Um, but we would love to stay in touch with you guys. Um, and so if you look on your bulletin on the bottom and the back is our email, is our web address. God is doing some really, really cool things. It's no, it's no surprise, there's no secret that church really isn't that cool in New England anymore, right? I think church is awesome, but I think you should go. But church was kind of cool here 200 years ago. And so one of the things that Loon Mountain Ministry does is we bring church to the people. And so not only here are we doing it, but at Waterville Valley Ski Resort we're doing it. Starting a new one up at uh, Pleasant Mountain this winter. One, some are going again at Shun, uh, Sunny River and Sugarloaf. And if you would love to support that movement of us bringing God's love to the people where they're at on vacation or second homeowners or locals or seasonal workers, that's what we love doing. So we'd also love to hear from you. If we can pray for you in any way. We absolutely love praying for people. We get to pray every week for people all over the world. Normally we have like a prayer request thing, but if you just email it to us on the back, if you'd like to support us, there is a QR code that takes you to a donation page. There's a support box in the back, the good old fashioned way of giving at church. We'd really appreciate your support. Thank you guys. You want to sing another song? Let's stand up. There's a lot to sing about today. There sure is. Yeah. The next song we have for you guys is called Yahweh. And, uh, as Marcus was saying a little bit earlier, you know, Jesus didn't come and give his life, sacrifice himself uh, for creation. Although we stand on a mountainside and we praise God, we're filled with wonder. We look out and we, we just, you know, it's, it's amazing, right? But out of all of God's creation, his most uh, beloved are, are his people, you and I. And so... It's a, it's a reminder to us that the, the, this song says, He who was and is to come is the one who lives in us, the creator of these mountains, the creator of, of all creation, um, made his home, made a way so that he could make his home in his people. And, and that's just amazing. So we're going to sing Yahweh.
you'll remain standing, Abishai is going to lead us in this morning's scripture reading. Um, good morning. On the front of your bulletin, you'll see the scripture for the day, and if you would read along, that'd be great. When you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Listen, my son, and be wise, and set your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. For an adulterous woman is in a deep pit, and a wayward wife is a narrow well. Like a bandit she lies in wait and multiplies the unfaithful among men. Who is woe? Who is ne- sorrow? Who is strife? Who is complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Proverbs 23, 1 through 5, 19 through 21, and 26 through 30. Thank you, Abishai. You may be seated. Wow, what a scripture to talk about on a beautiful fall day on a mountaintop. No, we at New Mountain Ministry very much believe that God's word is what it says it is. And it says that it is profitable for changing our hearts. That the word of God is truth, and that truth exceeds time. Am I not on? Come on, yeah, I've got a green light here. Am I just not trying to see it? Am I just not trying to see it? No, it helps us, right? It helps us on this one. All right, we're going to go old school style. I don't want to be tethered. Oh, we can't record. Oh, sorry. We do a podcast, so I can't go old school. I do not like technology. All right, podcast people, World Wide Web, this is for you. We're tethered. You want to try that? All right. Oh, man, Mark, you are awesome. Everyone give a round for Mark. So here's what we find doing outdoor church. So we've gone all over the place. The people in the podcast that have no visual right now are like, oh my God, oh my God. We had technical problems. When you do outdoor church and there's moisture, we find that our equipment only lasts so long. And then it, no matter what we do, it's just gone. But it's worth doing church outside, right? Awesome. Am I good? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so we are in the book of Proverbs. And man, I really lost my train of thought here, uh, other than it was going to be a really difficult sermon to give on such a beautiful day. But the book of Proverbs r- was written by a gentleman named Solomon, who the Bible, oh, I know what I was trying to tell you, is that the Bible says that it is profitable for us to be in and it changes our lives. And so at Loon Mountain Ministry, we wholeheartedly believe that. And so when we preach through God's word, we don't just go, ooh, that looks really difficult to understand, or oh, that looks really difficult to take to heart, and oh, that's a little too close to home. We're just going to skip over that part and go to the warm. Now, my, my flesh would love to do that, but the spirit of the Lord says, no, I love you. We're going to walk through this together. So here we go. We're walking through the book of Proverbs. We have chosen the book of wisdom. Uh, This is our third book of wisdom. It's our last book of wisdom that we're covering. And we're going through chapter by chapter. We have said uh, many, many times from the front here, the word of God is incredible. 
It is an awesome uh, rhythm, a practice for you to be in God's word daily. Not easy. I always say this, like I am paid to be in God's word daily and it is still hard for me. So those that aren't ministers, aren't paid pastors, it's, it is hard, but it is worth it. And if you are completely new to the Bible and you're like, where do I start? Proverbs would be a great place. There's 31 chapters. There's usually 31 days in a month. Just go to your phone, figure out what day it is, flip to that chapter of Proverbs and say, Lord, this is true. This is real. Show me yourself in this scripture. I want to learn from you. And you just read it. And you'll see what happens. It's incredible. So we are uh, in Proverbs chapter 23. Like I told you, it's written by the wisest man who ever lived. The Bible says that, but also history books will say that too. People who are even outside of scripture. Wisest man who ever lived. His wisdom was given by God. And you know what makes me feel uh, okay? Is when you read the Bible, you'll quickly find that we humans are just normal. We make big mistakes. So our buddy Solomon, God grants him wisdom. He's the wisest man in the world. And then he goes and breaks all the rules, which Eunice was talking about. He leaves and breaks all the rules that are told to him in the Old Testament. So if the wisest man made mistakes, I'm going to make mistakes too. And that's why Jesus came, is to forgive me of my sin and forgive you of your sin. And so Solomon is the wisest man who ever lived. And he wrote the book of Proverbs for his son. Right, And his son's about ready to go off into the big world. So that was my daughter, Abishai, who read. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Abishai. She's 16, and she's a junior. So this time next year, you know, we're going to be thinking about colleges and leaving. And so, uh, Abishai, this sermon is for you. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Anyone else? But it's also for us, too. We are, like I said earlier, we are God's children. We are God's chosen children. What's beautiful, the book of Ephesians says that you and I were chosen before the foundations of the earth. The book of Acts in chapter 17 says that you and I were born where we were born, when we were born, and who we were born to, so that in our lifetime, we might see that God is close and we would reach out and find a relationship with him. That's something really cool to think about. Next time you're upset at God for where you were born and who you were born to and what your life and the cards you were dealt, know that you could have been born in God's plan any other time in history, but you have been born where you've been born and who you've been born to because this is going to give you the ultimate chance to come close to God, reach out, and be in a relationship with him. What a beautiful truth that the book of Acts gives us. So we're in Proverbs chapter 23, and you can just see this dad, right? sitting on the edge of his son's bed, his senior son in high school. Or maybe he's like pulled up his kid's desk chair, you know, and he's sitting there in his son's room. And he says, son, I just want to talk to you about a couple things before you uh, go off to school. And the son's like, oh boy, here we go. You know, it's like that new Ram truck commercial when uh, the dad feels really manly because he got a truck and he's in the truck and he goes, All right, son, uh, I want to talk to you what it is to be a man. And the kid rolls his eyes, you know. And um, But you can see this conversation. And chapter 23 covers three really important issues. I'm a minister. I've been now for 10 years, but my dad was a minister, and I was the son of a pastor's kid, so I watched my dad be a pastor for 30 years. And one of the things that happens in a minister's office is as we work through marriage, And as marriages in the church and marriages outside the church are really struggling, they come into our office and they said, we need some help. And the three subjects in here are the top three issues when you look at why divorce happens, right? Number one, money. You heard it talked about in this chapter today. Number two, adultery. You heard it talked about in this chapter today. And number three, addictions you heard drunkenness and you heard gluttony addictions are a big reason why relationships end and so this dad Solomon the wisest man in the world sits down with his son he says son I want to talk to you about gluttony I want to talk to you about drunkenness I want to talk to you about adultery I don't want to talk to you about money and the, the kid was probably like oh boy here we go so I want to talk to me I want this scripture to talk to me. I want to talk to you about these subjects. 
you know? Because we live in a society as Americans. If you were here last week, we looked at money. If you were born in the United States of America, I don't care what you make for money. If you were born here, you are in the top 5% wealthiest people in the world. Let me say that again. If you were born in the United States, if you're living here right now, you are in the top 5% wealthiest people in the world. And you might think, no way. Folks, you just rode a gondola to church. Okay? You just, okay? Let's just, let's just put that in perspective for a second here. You just rode a multi-million dollar piece of equipment to get to church. And the thing we learned last week about money is money is fuel. And money fuels things like gut gluttony. Money fuels things like adultery. Money fuels things like drunkenness. And money fuels things like greed. And so I can hear this dad, and he's talking about the freshman 15, right? The freshman 15 pounds, the freshman 15 relationships, maybe the freshman 15 drinks, and maybe the freshman 15 dollars. You know, he's talking about the freshman 15 what I have found about myself and what I have found about the church is there, and especially the church in America, is there acceptable sins and there's not acceptable sins. There are socially acceptable sins in the church. And I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty. This sermon is to me. Drunkenness is not an acceptable sin in the church. Adultery, not an acceptable sin in the church. But those weren't the only two sins talked about in this chapter. Gluttony was talked about in this chapter. Very socially acceptable sin in the church. And greed was talked about in this chapter. Another very socially acceptable sin in the church. The Bible does not say that these are socially acceptable. The Bible actually says the opposite. The Bible compares a glutton to a drunkard. Let me say that again, Christian Evangelical Church of America. Let me say that to Marcus Corey. The Bible compares a glutton to a drunkard. But a lot of our conservative evangelical church world does not. Drunkenness is a worse sin than gluttony. The Bible does not differentiate between that. And actually, Jesus does not either. And Jesus' famous words is that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, is what Jesus said. So money as a sin, the love of money as a sin, in Jesus' eyes, is very, very dangerous. Gluttony is just as dangerous as drunkenness. Gluttony is just as dangerous as adultery. The Bible is so serious about gluttony being dangerous is that the Bible today, its language in chapter 23, Solomon says, if you struggle with gluttony, put a knife to your throat. That is the visual. That's the visual, people. Jesus was so serious about adultery and the sin of adultery, he says in Matthew chapter 5, 29 through 30, he says this, If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. That's Jesus referring to adultery. See, Jesus knew the Latin root word of adultery. You know what adultery actually means? The root word? I used to think it was adult. That only adults commit adultery when I was a kid. But actually adultery means close to or near. The Latin word means near. And we in the church have a socially acceptable adultery. And that's an emotional affair with someone else or an emotional affair with our work, an emotional affair with our career, an emotional affair with our hobbies. See, 
We as an American people and we as the church don't like talking about sin. And when we don't talk about it, we don't understand it. What we don't talk about, we don't understand. And so sin becomes this secretive thing, this hush-hush thing. And you know what we do with secrets? We judge people on them. We do. We go, pss, 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 pss. did you know that, you know? I'll never forget. I came back to my high school after four years of college. I was working at a Christian camp, and I needed a job in the fall, winter, and spring. So school was a good option because I wanted the summer off to work at the Christian camp. They had a long-term sub position. And because I had a college degree, I could get paid as if I was a teacher without having a teaching degree to be a long-term sub. Perfect! This was going to be great. This was back in my old high school, right? Well, guess what I found out? There's no difference between the middle school cafeteria and the teacher lounge. The same sins reside. I never forget, I went into the teacher lounge for the, my first lunch at school as a teacher. And I was warming up my chili in the microwave. And behind me was a group of adults sitting at a table. And all of a sudden I heard, can you believe that she went to the movies with him in this town? She could have at least gone to another town and not gone to the movies with him in this town. And I was like, what cafeteria am I in? Is this the high school or is this the teacher lounge? Some things never change. The human heart is the human heart. And Jesus understood this. And these are the words that Jesus was speaking and see, we cannot just stop sin, this secretive thing. The enemy wins if we just keep this a secret. Because secrets mean that we judge others and we never let any healing come to ourselves. And Jesus came to be the light and to shed the light on this sin of all kinds. And to not judge them and put them in socially okay sinned order. Paul was very clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul was very clear that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Solomon is very clear that gluttony, adultery, and the love of money will ruin a life. Will ruin a life. It does not matter if you throw a church sticker or a Jesus fish sticker on your car and still have the love of money. It will ruin your life. It doesn't matter if you wear a Christian hat or a Christian shirt and still have the love of sex. It will ruin your life. It doesn't matter if you go on missions trips or if you attend church every Sunday and you can diagnose the Bible with the best of them, but still have the love of money. It will ruin your life. Don't sit in the church and look outside and say, oh, all their lives are ruined because they're not doing the right thing. They're not following the rules. Because the love of anything other than God will ruin your life. All sin is, and this is why we should not keep it a secret, all sin is, is misdirected love. All sin is, is misdirected love. See, love is this. Love is the belief that if I give myself to something, that something will save me. Love is that if I give myself to something, that something will fulfill me. Guys, your and my sin doesn't grieve our Father in Heaven's heart like my kids not obeying me grieves my heart. Why does my sin not my, my kids not obeying me grieve my heart? Because it's annoying. Because it's frustrating. Because it, it, it ruins my day. God is God. He doesn't need your obedience. God is God. He doesn't need my sacrifice. This is the beauty of the God we worship. His sin, our sin, excuse me, our sin breaks his heart. 
because it captivates and kills our spirit, our soul. It ruins our life. That's why it breaks the heart of a father. It's very similar. Have you noticed that the sin of your middle schooler is annoying, but the sin of your college kid breaks your heart? Have you noticed the difference? And think about you and I in the college realm. And that's what Proverbs 23 is saying. The heart of God breaks for your sin and my sin, not because it ruins his day. Not because it takes him off of his perfect course or it, it is an annoyance to him. It ruins his day because it ruins your life. And he gave his son to save your life. And it breaks his heart when he sees you love something that will not set you free. Man, I love barbecue. I love chicken wings. And I love to chase them down with a non-Baptist drink. But none of those things have saved me. The opposite. They have cost me money. And odds are, my doctor has said, that they are costing me my life. And you that don't have eating issues, look at me or look at others and point the finger. But your love of being right or your love of your health, your love of your running or your hiking, your love of your career, your love of your children, your love of your children, your love of your dog, your love of your 401k, your love of your ministry, you, you fill in the blank with what you love. It is and will and has never saved you. It just isn't. And that's what we have to come to grips with. And that is what Solomon is telling his son. He says, son, be careful not to stare at the glass of wine and think, oh, this glass will save me. Isn't that the lie of the drunken life? This glass, this one. The next one will save me. Isn't that the lie of the greedy American? The next job, the next deal, that will save me. Then I'll be set. The next deal, I'll be set. We learned last week, it does not matter how much money you have. Forbes and Sports Illustrated wrote a, an article that 80% of NFL players are bankrupt three years after they retire. So, folks, it's not about how much money, okay? You can just keep hucking all the money you want at a problem. And heart disease around the world, but more specifically heart disease in America, is the number one killer. Heart disease many of it preventable through proper diet and exercise. Now, here's the thing. Is food good? Amen, it's good. <laughs> is money good? Amen, it's good. And is sex good? Amen, it's good. But the love of any of those will leave you in ruins. It will ruin a life. You don't believe me? Check this out. The pornography industry grosses more money each year. You ready for this? Than the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, National Hockey League, and World Cup Soccer combined. It's a bigger industry than the oil industry. The love of something drives us. And don't look across the street and go, well, at least I'm not addicted to that. We all are addicted to something. We all turn to something for our hope and our joy and our faith that isn't God. Whether that's your children or that's your job or it's your routine or it's your space or it's your time or whatever, it's your vacation. 
We all turn to something and look to it to save us. So do we have any hope? Is there any hope to come off this track of loving the gifts of God? See, money, gift from God. Sex, gift from God. Food, good gift from God. Benjamin Franklin was a smart guy. And he said, we have proof that God loves us. It's called beer. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin actually said that, folks. If you are an individual who has an issue with alcohol, you know, whether it be that you, uh, you, you look at, like this said, the glass, and you, 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 you're, you have, you, you, you're, you're, you're prone to be alcoholic, that's not okay. Or if you're on the opposite side, and you're a teetotaler, and you're judging people for drinking. What I think both of you should do is read this book. Well, one, you should read the Bible. But another book that's really good called Searching for God in Guinness. The True Story of Oz Guinness. Unbelievable book. And you know what I think is a riot? There's a lot of, of churchgoers that really judge drinking. But boy, you know what they love? Sunday school. Don't they? They love, I do. They love Sunday school. You know who invented Sunday school? Oz Guinness, people. I'm not even joking. Read the book. It's actually incredible. Man, I'm off on a tangent now. <laughs> but these are good gifts from God. But when we worship the gift and not the giver, we're ridiculous. We're ridiculous. We're ridiculous. Parents, I bet you feel this way on Christmas morning sometime, where you've worked very hard to make Christmas incredible for your kids. And then they get that thing that they've really wanted and they quickly forget about you, correct? And you're sitting there watching them and they get joy that brings you a little joy, but they quickly forget, they're like, where's the batteries? Did you get the batteries? You didn't get the right batteries? How did you not get the right batteries, mom? You knew what batteries is needed. Wow. Ridiculous, right? We look the same way with our food and our sex and our money. These are all just gifts. They are not the gift giver. But back to the question of hope. How do we have hope to not fall in love with the gifts? The gifts are so good. And everyone around us, including me, are in love with the gifts. How do we have hope? Here's some verses that give us hope. 2 Timothy 1.17 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and of self-discipline. Oh, there's hope in the spirit of God. Not in the spirit of Marcus. Not in the good old-fashioned New England, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do this. No, the hope is in the spirit of God. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26-27, So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching, ding, 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 Marcus, I fear that after preaching to others that I myself might be disqualified. Michaela Schifrin arguably one of the greatest skiers who ever lived, trains six days a week, averaging five to six hours a day for a 30-second run, maybe a minute run, or maybe a two-minute run if she's skiing downhill. All summer long she trains for a flash in a pan. That's what Paul was thinking about when he wrote this. Well, I don't know about Michaela, but I'll be excited to talk to him about Michaela when we get to heaven. Because <laughs> sometimes I feel like Michaela in my spiritual walk, where it's a grind, it's a grueling grind to train my body not to love the gift, not to fall in love with the chicken wing, <laughs> and not to fall in love with my earthly possessions like my wife or Loon Mountain Ministry, good stuff. I've never met a drunkard that says, oh, it's good. They want to be done with it, right? I've never met a heroin addict that's, addict that's like death, that's awesome. They want to be done with it. But I've met a ton of Christians that don't want to be done gluttony. I've met a ton of Christians that don't want to be done loving their children over God. I've met a ton of Christians that don't want to be done loving their, 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 their church over God or their ideology 
over God. But I train my body, and sometimes I feel like I'm training this spiritual discipline for what? For just a blink of an eye sometimes. I go long times where I feel like, what am I doing? But my hope is in the giver, not the gift. This one gives me a lot of hope. Titus 2, 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. What an incredible passage of Scripture. It is the grace of God that gives me the strength to say no to worldly passions. It is not his firm hand. It is not his judgment. It is not his wrath. It is not his rules. It is not his Ten Commandments. All good stuff. But it is the grace of God that teaches me to say no to worldly passions and helps me live a self-controlled, upright life. What I love is it through an in this present age. My wife and I were talking last night about separatism in Christianity and how we love to separate our kids from the world so that we can say, okay, over here in this little pen, you know, don't watch that, don't see them, don't talk to them. And we say, don't have, you know, unsaved friends or don't be around unsaved people because they could corrupt you. It is very different than when I grew up. You could do that. You could corral your kids. I don't think it was healthy, but you could corral your kids into this little separatist bunker thing where it's all the same people who all think think the same way so that you would never have your child think outside the box. You know what? I don't know if you can do that today. You know why? They all have this. When I went to public school for the first time and broke out out of that little bubble, I heard words that I had never heard before that I can't talk about here. I actually got sent to the office because I said one to a teacher while everyone laughed because they had me go say it to the teacher and I didn't know the word. And I'm so thankful for the assistant principal because when he came, when I came to the office, I mean my first time in public school, I'm in the office in the first week. And he started talking to me and he realized this kid doesn't know what that word means. And I'm not about ready to explain it to him. Just don't say it, son, again. I know you don't know what it means. I'm not telling you. Maybe if you want to ask your parents, you can. But they might not know what it means either because they go to church. I'm not going to tell you. Okay? But now I don't know. All the, you, you, can be, you can be raised under a rock and come and find. You, don't know, you, you know all the words because of this. Where was I going with that? I don't really know. I don't know. Oh, this present age. Because I'd like to show up in heaven and say to, 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 to Paul, yeah, try being a Christian in 2022, bro. We got the internet. You know, we got smartphones. You know, we got room service. You know, try being a Christian now. But what's so beautiful is when the Holy Spirit penned these words, when the Holy Spirit penned these words, The Holy Spirit knew whoever was reading this would be in their present age. It's never been any easier to be a Christian or any harder to be a Christian. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell and sin entered the world, and the Bible says death by sin, and so death passed upon all humankind. From that moment until when Jesus comes back in his glory, it has been difficult to be a Christian. So when your mom or my mom or your grandma or my grandma says that the world's getting worse, uh, we just know about more what people are doing because of this. Because when you start like, don't give me that, mom. I know what you did. There's a reason why cars from the 60s had huge back seats. I'm not dumb. And you say that to them, they're like, how did he know? Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
But I want to end with this. Titus chapter 2, and I'll read it again, 11. For the grace of God has appeared that salvation to all, everyone here, all 8 billion people in the world, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, to live a self-right and upright and godly life in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, that is the greatest witness. When you and I pursue the goodness of God, when you and I fall in love with the gift giver over the gift, it will make your spouse, it'll make your neighbor, it'll make your co-worker say, whoa, that's different. Huh. Be like, yeah, let me introduce you to God the good father who gives good gifts to those whom he loves and who love him. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Solomon writing this to his son before he went off into the big world. God's sin is real. But God, your grace is more. Your grace is greater than all of our sin. That is beautiful. Help us not to just focus on the negative. Help us to put faith and hope and love in you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might say no to the worldly passions. And God, help us to worship you through being thankful for food, through being thankful for money, through being thankful for sex, for understanding its right purpose in life, the gift that it's given to us. Thank you for the good gifts. Help us not to worship them. In your name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to stand as we close with How Great Thou Art.
great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's our prayer that you would put your faith in Jesus and follow him daily. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.